So Anthony is um, uh, an author of um, adult uh, children's, young adults literature, and also um, you know some of his uh, books you will find at Bookworm and uh, Stag Hunt, Mortal Coil, um, Hellbent, uh, The Knife That Killed Me. They all sound right? very dark, so don't they, so far? <laughs> So I'm, I'm sure you know there's a lighter side of that there as well, um, and also he's written for yeah younger children and adults, um, and we'll get to know more and um, about Tony. And Daniel uh, is a writer, editor, translator, and um, I'm fascinated to know that you've translated 50 books from from three different languages into English. And um, and do you want to show your uh, real big volume up there so um, and I'm, I'm waiting to collect that to you know uh, learn more about children's literature uh, it'll be my companion as well hopefully uh, very soon so uh, you know before we begin I think uh, we also have I think we also have some children in the audience um, so just wanted to find out because children's literature is something that um, as a publisher, it, it interests me uh, to know more about what children read nowadays, what they're interested in, and what I grew up reading. So, and of course, you know, we, we definitely read different things when we were growing up. So, uh, if I may start with Daniel, um, you know, how, how do you see that, you know, what children read now and how you read as a child uh, is different? Um, thank you. That's a it's an interesting and very big question, and, I, and in some ways the, the answer is, uh, I think, not at all. I think the way children read doesn't change mostly. I think the way people read on the whole doesn't change very much. Um, I think there are some differences, not least the fact that the, the kind of scope of what's published for children, the amount of it and the range of it is so enormous now in a way that wasn't the case when I was a child 30, 35 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, I'll stop at 40, I'm just kind of going 50, 60, 70, 70, when I was a child, 75 years ago. Um, so w one of the things that has changed is, is there is a huge amount of, there's a huge amount of range. Um, in the UK, which is a fairly big book market, we publish something like 30,000 children's books a year, 20 something thousand. Um, which is an awful lot. And what, one of the things that means is that it's harder and harder to make a living as a children's writer because the number of children hasn't increased and the amount they read hasn't increased. The amount of competition, however, has increased. But in some senses, the, the fact that the range has increased is a really exciting thing because it means that in theory, it should be easier and easier for children to find just the right books for them. There are more people writing for uh, teenage readers in a way that barely existed 30 years ago. Um, books are tackling subjects that they weren't necessarily 30 years ago. I mean, I think there's a, there, there's a kind of expansion of what children's books are doing uh, that's happened over the last 30 years. But I think the, f the fundamental things that people, that children are looking for in books today are the same things that I was looking for when I was reading Roald Dahl. In so I was born in 1973, which means Roald Dahl was writing when I was a kid, so these things were new, and I remember the BFG being published, and I remember Matilda being published because they were being produced for me, basically. The BFG came out when I was eight years old. Um, but I don't think that experience is dramatically different now. Okay. So um, would you say the same thing? Uh, since that would you're be slightly boring, wouldn't it? I said exactly the same thing. but. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, that was quite no, no. boring the first time. You could, you could improve on it. You, you could rephrase um, it. You thought my answer was boring. Um, I can't believe it. We're from rather different backgrounds, and my experience of reading as a child was completely different. Um, in the, the, I was from a house without very many books, uh, and so when I was a younger child, my experience of stories was through my, my, my father telling them to me. I'm one of five children, and my dad would, uh, at the end of the day, he'd lie in, in, a, in our bedroom. We'd all lie around him, and he'd tell stories that he was basically making up. Um, after that, I became obs obsessed as a, as a little boy with, um, with facts, facts about the world, especially facts about, about warfare and facts about animals. And so I filled my head full of, of those kind of things. On the, on the way in here from the, from the airport, we, we, we went past, a, I think it was a, the, the Bangladeshi Air Force Recruitment Center, and there was a, a full-size um, airplane there. 
And I, I instantly knew from my, as a, as a seven-year-old, exactly what kind of aircraft it was. It was a, a MiG-21. I could have told you it's armament, it's top speed. So I had to follow those, and also facts about animals. My, my, my main reading, actually, as a boy, was something called the Guinness Book of Animal Facts and Feats, which is simply a list of grotesque and disgusting facts about animals. Uh, and I can still tell you that the tiger that's eaten the most number of human beings, it's a terrifying number. Um, so, th th so that was my kind of background as a younger child, when, when you were reading Roald Dahl. And then when I was nine, I think, a teacher at my junior school gave me a copy of The Lord of the Rings, which I see most of you are aware of, um, which probably is just about a book for children, but quite an advanced one. And I'd never read a, a novel by that stage. I'd never even read any Enid Blyton books. So I didn't know what kind of thing it was. And it took me, uh, you know, I think it took me three years, to, to two years perhaps, to, to read it. Um, but that for me was a transformational process. Um, uh, and, and then so as, a, as a reader, I had that slightly odd experience. And then, then as a, um, but later on, I had that terrible thing that happens to human beings, happens to me, and I, I had children. And so I, 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 um, I spent a lot of time then reading to my children. So, that, so my main experience of the classics of children's literature, like Roald Dahl, was as a reader to my children, which was an, an incredibly wonderful thing to do. And you, you know the books that work and the books which don't by the amount of wriggling and squiggling you get from your child. And when a book really captures them, they have that, that thousand yard stare when the world is being created in front of them or, or they've just filled their nappy. It's one of the, those two things, usually the, the thousand yard stare. Sorry. And you also discover presumably that what, how the, the younger ones work as well because when you're reading to your kids, when you're reading a picture book and you have to read it for the 793rd time, <laughs> you can really tell. And some of them are actually bearable 793 times, yeah. but many are not. So, Lord so of the Rings. I would, I, 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 we may have to talk about Lord of the Rings at some point because I hated it with such passion. Um, it's a great, it was a great reaction. <laughs> it was mocking laughter. I said I hated it, so there, and you're not going to persuade me otherwise. So uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned about your father, and then you're you're also now reading to your children. So you know. How do you also have to, do, as, as a writer, do you also have to keep in mind whether, you know, there isn't much of parent and con parental control nowadays, is there? I'm, I'm not sure, but, you know, what's your experience in your writing and your, you know, selling your books and or getting feedback from your readers that is there, um, you know, do, do parents um, have a role to play and, and how does it work? Well, it's it's... Um, I, I don't think there is necessarily quite the same amount of control of what children consume generally because children have access to the internet and so forth. But there's still an issue which comes up a lot when we're talking about children's books in the UK um, of what we talk about as, the, as gatekeepers in children's publishing, which is to say for Tony to write a book and a child to discover this book and love this book isn't simply a matter of him writing a book and giving it to them and them loving it. There are, you know, 93 other people who have to approve of what he's done on the way, all of whom are grown-ups, um, which as publishers, it may be parents, it may be librarians, it's people who buy books, it's people who commission books in publishing houses. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing, or it's not in every case a bad thing, but it does mean that there are, there are certain controls over what gets to children. There are grown-ups deciding which books will have a really big marketing budget and which books will disappear quietly and we hope no one finds them, you know. Um, and so there is still, even though children have much more direct access to a lot of what's happening in the world through, through because of technological advances and so forth, um, there's still, I think, a sense that one of the things that makes the children's book, the children's writing world different from most other kinds of writing is there are these various stages at which the process of the book is either sped up or impeded by people who are not the target readers. Most people, I mean, it's slightly different if you write for teenagers, but if you write a book for three-year-olds or five-year-olds or seven-year-olds, it's not the three-year-old who goes into a bookshop with their credit card and buys it. Um, they possibly buy things on Amazon with credit cards, but I'm not sure whether that's, uh, whether that's encouraged. So that's, you know, precisely why I was... Um you know, wondering whether, you know, how do you navigate through all these, you know, 93 gatekeepers and, um, you know, finally reach with your ideas to that three-year-old or that 14-year-old that you're writing for? Yes. 
Well, I, it might help if I explained how I got into publishing and m my approach came, came from that. That um, I, I'd, I'd have, uh, been thought that I would be a writer for quite a long time and essentially failed to do that. And I ended up doing an incredibly tedious job um, working for the government. Everyone's nightmare kind of boring and tricky job at the same time. <laughs> and I, I thought of an idea for a story. And it was at a time when the concept of YA or young adult literature first started to circulate in the press. But back then, I, I, with that, I didn't research it properly. And I, I assumed that, that YA, young adult, meant people who were actually adults, were just young adults, so people in their 20s, perhaps, as I was back then. So I, I, I wrote a book um, called Hellbent, which is about actually a teenage boy who dies and goes to hell and is subjected to all kinds of humiliations in hell. It's a, it's a sort of dark comedy. Um, but it's a very, very adult comedy. It's uh, full of scatological humor and complex philosophical discourses uh, and uh, in this context of, of a hellish punishment of a teenager. Um, and I sent it off thinking that it was a masterpiece. It got universally rejected, um, often not even personalized rejections, but dear sir stroke madam, your book stroke novel, did, did delete as necessary. Um, but eventually, uh, via an also complicated process, I, I, which involved um, having a virtual sex change and <laughs> writing popular fiction for adults, I, I got that book published. Uh, but it had it was slightly cleaned up and then sold as a book for teenagers, YA. Um, so I find myself without really mean to be a, a writer for teenagers and without having really focused on it. Um, and then after that point, I really did start to think about how do I engage with teenagers. And for me, that was mainly a process of, of remembering what I was like, going back in time and praying that those same concerns were still relevant now. Uh, and then what happened to me was after writing a few teenage books, I, I had the children that I mentioned earlier on and then began to write, write for them. So my work seemed to be getting, getting gradually younger. I did fear that eventually I'd end up writing those, um, those padded, quilted books which babies wipe their drool on <laughs> with a picture of a carrot on every page. That would be my, my destiny. It still, still might be. So, um, yeah, but, but so I became a children's writer without really meaning to be one. Um, but I, I, the way I try and go about that now is by, um, well, it's, there's two paradigms that you often encounter about the writing process. Um, and there's one that, that views writing as being um, a sort of internal process, almost like, like producing and, and laying an egg. Uh, and your, your, your focus is inwards, and you have this, this great work within you, um, which you then present to the world, which I always think a bit like um, when your, your, your children are learning to use the, the potty for the first time, and you try and encourage them, and finally they produce this thing, and they show it to you, and they're very proud of this thing that this was inside them is now outside them. So that's, the, that's that internal paradigm of creativity. But I prefer to think about it as a, a conversation, that, it's, um, that, that reading and writing are a, a collaborative process. Uh, and so you, you know, as a reader, you've got to create, you, you turn our words into worlds. So that's a, a creative act in itself. So for me, I'm always thinking about who I'm writing for. And if that's for teenagers, and I'm thinking about them as teenagers, what will engage with them, and the same thing for, for younger children. Did that in any way answer your question? I can't remember what the question was now. Was it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think it did and, and did some more. So, yeah. Um, so, are you also uh, conscious of um, gender or, you know, how the, the new uh, ideas of, you know, I, do you write with a, with, a, with a girl or a boy in mind or, you know, does that happen? Does that, you know, you, I think both of you can respond to that. Is, is, does that play in when you're, you know, your current consciousness of gender, does it sort of, uh, in, a, in any way hinder or facilitate when you're writing? I think there are very few writers who would, there are some, but relatively few writers who would admit to writing books with uh, a particular gender readership in mind. Um, I suspect more do it than admit to it, but that's fine. Um, the conversation happens uh, in a, it happens frequently in a slightly surreptitious fashion uh, in publishing houses much more than uh, I think when authors talk, because publishers have to decide things like what color is the jacket, if we're going to advertise, where are we going to advertise. Um, there are certain writers who are sold specifically to uh, girl readers or boy readers because this is seen as, um, I'm not sure, I think, it, I think it's partly lazy and it's partly pragmatic. Um, but it's, it's a conversation that usually happens relatively, either relatively late in the production process, so Tony writes a book and then someone says, well, this book has a boy central character and he does boy things, and so we don't have very much imagination, so we have to keep selling it to boys. 
or there are particular writers who are identified with this, and as a result, their readership is, is more or less, more or less self-selecting. So one of the best, uh, best loved children's writers in the UK is a woman called Jacqueline Wilson, who, regardless what she writes, and regardless for whom she thinks she is writing, the publishers are selling the books to girls, and the books are being bought by girls and boys. If they're reading them, they're reading them in a slightly embarrassed fashion because they are books for girls. Well, um, most of my, my teenage books in particular have um, uh, a male teenage first-person narrator. Um, and I find that a very easy way, way to write because, well, you know, I, I am, I, I've written from an adult male perspective because I am an adult male. I've written from an adult female perspective because most of my closest friends are, are women, so I think I can get into that mind. I've written from a, a, a teenage boy's perspective because I was one again. I, I could never and will never write from a teenage girl's perspective. Because I've got no idea what goes inside on inside the head of a teenage girl. I, I was frightened of them as a teenage boy. I'm frightened of them now. Uh, so, so, so teenage girls um, always appear as a terrifying other in my in my teenage books, objects of adoration or terror, essentially. Um, maybe that's even all, all women now. Um, but uh, so, uh, but, but but also um, in, in the UK in particular, there's a big problem with getting boys to read. Uh, you know, to, uh, in the in Britain. Just girls read much more than, than boys. I don't know if it's the same in, in, in Bangladesh or. Uh, no. um, so, even though I suppose, my, my books are. Uh, my great challenge is to get boys to read. So, although perhaps you might su suggest that there's not enough gender diversity in, in, in my work, it, that's kind of legit legitimized by the fact I'm doing this challenging task of trying to get boys to read into, into the world of books. So, do children read in the, in the conventional uh, idea of reading um, enough? you think or I mean you know with with the advent of other medium that they're exposed to I mean how you know is, is does that pose a challenge for you as as authors or do you also keep that other mediums in mind when you're when you're um, you know crafting your stories I think there are still too few writers who are excited about the possibilities that varying kind of technological entertainment can offer them in terms of the way they write. I still think most people feel that's a bit of a threat. And if they're playing games, it's because they're not doing something serious like reading my novel. And that is therefore something for anxiety or fear or whatever it is. Um, I think all of us I'm one of like, those. Yes. For example, I'm just a random example. We have an author on stage here with me. Um, I think we would all like to to read more. I think the reasons for that are possibly obvious. And there are certain things, as Tony says, that we, that we see as particular targets like boys and like boys of a particular age, because actually it's not just a matter of, you know, girls reading more than boys. It's a matter of people until the age of 10 or 11 reading much more and a lot of people stopping reading then and then not coming back to it. So there are particular, if you like, problem areas. Um, and they call, I, I call them problem areas because I'm assuming that we know that it's a problem that they don't read because we're at a literature festival, so I'm assuming that mostly people here think reading is not an absolutely horrendous thing to do, um, <laughs> unless you're just lost. But uh, on the assumption that reading is a good thing, I think we, people are always concerned about there not being enough of it or it not being varied enough or it not being rich enough or it not being something enough. Um, but there are still a lot. As I said, we publish a huge number of books, and some, some of them are... are still being read, but even selling some, I mean, not very many, but some. Do they end up selling to a different audience than you had intended the books for? Uh, has there been any such experience that you, you know, thought of a certain age group or a certain demography or something in your head when you were writing, and then it, it, would, it, it became popular with a completely different Well, and anyone who's writing that. young adult fiction knows that the, the, the great majority of young adult books are bought by women in their 20s and 30s. I yeah, was convinced more, more than 50% of, of sales of young adult books um, so you across the that. English speaking world. Yeah. You already know that when you're writing? Or? You know, that's a recent fact that came out. But, but I mean, my experience was that I always thought I was writing for 16, 17 year old boys. It turns out that most of my readers were 12 year old girls. And that's quite a slightly, just because they read everything in the UK. So that they read, they read on the whole, they read up. Then there was this fact recently that, that many of these YA books are, re are, are in fact read by adult women, young, you know, women in their, as you said, 20s and 30s. And, and it's quite understandable because they're really written for people like that. I think they almost deliberately exclude teenagers from their, from their world. Interesting, yeah. So, so how does that feel when you, when you have that revelation? That, you know? <laughs> I don't know. 
that's not a question necessarily. But you, you're, Back onto your, your question. It's a great market, it's a great untapped market. There are lots yes. more people in their 20s and 30s than, than are, you know, 12 to 16 year old boys. But your original question behind that was about um, the challenge of new technology and other forms of, uh, you know, I, I do see it as a kind of, I suppose as a, as a threat because um, th th often they're, they're amazing. I, I, my, with a few years ago, I sat there with my son, we played a game called Red Dead Redemption on uh, his um, PlayStation. And it's like you're in a film. It just is incredibly immersive and, you know, intellectually challenging. And it's, um, it's quite hard for, for a book to, to match that kind of I immersiveness. Uh, um, Although it's a, a challenge that we should should rise to, um, but also a kind of is a we, we live in a very as you were saying you're all here because you're book people, and we live in a, in cultures which value liter liter literature and the world of books, um, but it's possible to have an incredibly complex em emotional intellectual life without being a big a big reader I guess, um, I, I I fear that that world, uh, and I think there are things that novels can that can do that other forms of entertainment can't do, um, but you're not a bad person because you don't read loads of books. And, you know, and there are some terrible books out there. You might, be, you might be a bad person. <laughs> you could be a bad person even after reading a lot of, lot of books. Oh, no, so no, 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 it's impossible. <laughs> New President okay, of the United I States, for example. <laughs> I shall try not to name. Um, yeah, we'll not talk about that, I guess. Not but he sure. doesn't read yeah. books. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I guess, you know, because there are so many original, original English um, you know, uh, writing coming out, uh, you don't need to necessarily translate, or you don't, do you, do you feel that the market requires, um, you know, uh, reading from other languages, other, other cultures, or if, if that's the case, then how do you, um, you know, how do you pick what to translate? Um, we, we have, we have a problem in the, uh, in the UK, but I think generally in the English speaking world, that for, for various reasons that I can go into, we have typically, in something like children's books, been very, very strong cultural exporters. So British children's books have been read around the world for a very long time. Alice in Wonderland is 151 years old. We basically haven't stopped producing children's books in that time and exporting them very successfully. Uh, we are terrible, terrible importers, kind of cultural importers. I, in fact, uh, grew up reading translated books as much as I read uh, English language books. I d had no idea they were translations, but I was reading alongside Roald Dahl, who was not translated, but who was Norwegian, in fact. But alongside Roald Dahl, I was also reading Pippi Longstocking and the Moomins and Asterix and Tintin and Pinocchio and fairy tales, all of which were translated. You know, my reading, like the reading of all of my friends of my age, was uh, was international and was translated as much as it was domestic. Um, and that was still seen, I mean, it was, it was normal and it was completely un, unremarked on. And we were, I think, unaware of it. It's very, very hard to find the kind of contemporary equivalent of those writers now, the people who are writing in other languages and finding their way into English. Um, there is basically one successful children's writer in the English-speaking world who didn't originally write in English. I can think of one who's a, a German writer called Cornelia Funke, who is translated into English. I think there are, there are two arguments for why we should have more of it, why it's important, because we do, as you say, have a huge amount that's being produced in English. There are people writing really, really good things, really varied things for all kinds of readers, all kinds of forms. So we certainly aren't short of interesting things, but I think there are two arguments for having more translated. One is, there are some things that you'll find in a story written in Bangla and translated into English, which however great a writer Tony is, he's not going to be able to do. It's always going to be different things. You get access to different things. The more kind of varied, the more broad the pool of writers you have access to. And the other is simply a matter of, simply a matter of quality. 90 something percent of people in the world don't speak English as their first language. Probably some of them are writing something good. It would be really weird if only the other 3% were writing good stuff. That would be, statistically, that's very improbable. So from a purely kind of qualitative point of view, if we're only allowing children access to the books written by those 3 or 4% of people in the world, British, American, Irish, Canadian, New Zealand, or Australian, whatever it may be, 
then we're just missing out on some really, really good things. If I was, if you know, when I was a kid 30 years ago, I could have only read Roald Dahl, who is great, and Philippa Pierce, who is great, and Joan Aiken, who is great, and Susan Cooper, who is great, who are writers I loved and wrote in English. But having those people and Astrid Lindgren was even better, and the Moomins and Asterix, I would have I would have swapped any of those people for Asterix. I tell you, even now I suspect would we'll swap almost any writer for Asterix to this day. Most of those writers you mentioned who were f um, from abroad, who do well in the UK, they, they were heavily illustrated texts, weren't they? I wonder if that's them, part yeah. of it. So it was that, that they had that they, they were almost equally visual and, and literary form. So it w was that why they became so popular here? I think in some cases that's probably true. In some cases that's probably true, though. Curiously, we ha it's even harder to translate picture to get picture books published in translation now than um, than kind of older fiction. I think it was more true in the past, and certainly some of those books were not only heavily illustrated, but also really, really well illustrated, that actually one of the things that makes them great books, one of the things that makes the Moomins completely unforgettable once you've read them is that they have their, their really strong visual component. But also I think we're probably talking about a market where a higher proportion of books were illustrated to some extent, even if not heavily illustrated, not least because the kind of things like YA, like young adult books, were, were a much tinier part of the market now. So, I mean, uh, the books that were from a different language or by a different um, nation, national nationality, uh, they were still being write, written in English and probably, I mean, there were some similarities um, because they were European writers or there were still, you know, there were some cultural similarities that, that sort of resonated with the market, if I may say so. Um, so is, do you think that could have been a barrier? Why, you know, maybe, um, you know, illustrated books from other cultures didn't really make its place uh, in your market, in your readership? Is that, I mean, could, I mean, I, I could say that it's, it's probably true for, for here that, you know, you know, we, we are always looking for other South Asian books when we are, you know, if we, um, but at the same time, I grew up right, reading, or you know, a, a bunch of my generation grew up reading um, books from Russia, and um, you know, uh, and they were. The, and, and the reason for that was not that they were culturally the same as your upbringing. They weren't, but but at the same time, I mean, you know, they were they were animals in in those books yeah. a lot, so it, they didn't have to have to have a skin color, of course. So, um, so is that is that something that may have you know, besides the fact that there's already a lot of material. Um, in the market, locally generated, is is could that be another reason? I don't, I'm just wondering. I'm sure that's part of it. I'm sure the the fact that that these things are steeped in their own cultures is, is part of it. On the other hand, a lot of the writers I've mentioned were also not writing books that were in any way that were obviously revealing of their own culture. That Asterix, uh, I think, tells you. Well, it tells you, probably tells you something about the France in which they were written, but only in the way that they tell you about any ludicrous society that you can think of. Um, but it's partly also a question of uh, how these things are disguised, I suppose, like using animals as an example. And it also comes back to Tony's question about the extent to which they're illustrated. One of the reasons I think we have a problem with getting illustrated books uh, published in translation in the UK is because illustrations look foreign really quickly because illustrative styles are, are cultured very specifically, illustrative influences are cultured very specifically, and you can sometimes translate a novel, and if it's a novel set, for example, in a wizarding boarding school, it doesn't have to be in a particular place, whereas there's something about the color palette, for example, that immediately means a publisher will look at something and go, well, that looks a little bit foreign, so I'm frightened of foreign things in a way that actually children, in, in terms of the sort of culture the books inhabit, the Harry Potter books in some ways feel like they're very, very particularly English because of that kind of, the, the influence of the boarding school stories. But those books are doing pretty well in other places, you know, just sold 650 million copies. So, and they weren't just, a, you know, a handful of children in England. No, I mean, it's just um, Daniel's field, but my only thought on this is the, the huge poignancy I felt, felt by meeting the, the amazing children's authors here, you know, from Bangladesh and Bhutan and India and around the world, and it's, it's really sad that you, you know, that you may well not be published in, in the UK. You know, our culture would be better for it if you, if you were. 
well, hopefully there'll be you know avenues now. So, um, but uh, I mean, uh, so illustration when you when you write, do you have a certain illustration in mind, or I mean, when you're writing for that age group, uh, or an illustrator in mind, or a style in mind, uh, because it's something that you know that's an integral part of that storytelling when you're writing for that age group. It, yeah, I mean, all, all my pre-teen books are illustrated, um, but I'm not a particularly visual person. I find it hard to imagine what you know a style for it. So I, I very much leave that to the professionals who can imagine my world for me. So you leave it to to the illustrators. Leave it to the pros. So okay, all right. Is that is that surprising? Yeah. I mean, when the pictures then show up, is that process of? of <laughs> well, I'm, you were I'm never not delighted by it. <laughs> but you were talking before about you know the the reading process being part of the thing that brings a book to life. Yeah. You know, so the, the thing that makes a book alive is someone writing it, but also someone reading it, and it's not just the writing in that first instance. And what you're seeing when, you, when an illustrator comes back to you is whatever crazy thing has happened in the head of this person when they read your book. Yeah, I mean, it's turned it into a new, a new thing. Uh, I suppose it's a vaguely similar feeling to uh, one of my books, and I think Kilby was made into a film. Um, so then an entirely visual media. Uh, and again, I, I was just simply astonished and delighted by it. And I, I tend to feel that about the, about the, the illustrations, because it's just so not my the way the, my mind works. So I, n I never don't just grin and gawp at the illustrations. But the, the one t I, I, I have done some illustrations in my children's books where occasionally if I want um, a child to do a drawing in the book, let's say a seven-year-old child, because I can draw like a seven-year-old child, that's my absolute limit, so I can do that. So, um, so you so I can draw like a seven-year-old <laughs> child who's not very good at drawing. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> uh, let me ask uh, Daniel then that you have worked with other uh, children's authors. So is it, uh, I mean, do they work differently with illustrators or is it, is it something that, is it, is it a, a thing to do that not to meddle with the illustration at all or is it, is it you know? Um, people, have to, people have different ways of, of working and a lot of times, especially with books for younger, for younger children, you'll end up with the sort of partnerships, writer and illustrator partnerships who work together, right. you know, over books and books and books and books. Yeah. You know, the, the most obvious example of picture books in the UK is the writer Julia Donaldson, who wrote The Gruffalo and lots of very successful books. And she's had lots of illustrators, but there's one particular illustrator, a guy called Axel Scheffler, with whom she's done lots of books and with whom her work is associated. Right. Um, there are also cases of, of uh, books for older children that where those partnerships happen, though they're slightly rarer. There's a, a writer called Philip Reeve who works with an artist called Sarah McIntyre, a writer called Paul Stewart who works with an artist called Chris Riddell. So sometimes you get these partnerships and they each form their own way of working. Julia Donaldson writes books, sends them to Axel, he illustrates them and they don't kind of go back and forth and back and forth. Okay. Those other examples I mentioned, Philip and Sarah and Chris Riddell and Paul Stewart, they really develop the thing together. They devise the story together, they devise the scenes together, and then one person does the words and one person does the pictures. But it's partly to do with, I think, the kind of comfort of how well that relationship works. And also it's probably, in, to some extent, to do with the kind of background the writers have. There are some writers who like writing and sit quietly and produce this thing which is ready at a certain point, and then they don't want to be told to change any the of The egg. Or the <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I think you know that makes sense because I think you know. Um, then, if if you're not a visual person, if you have somebody visualizing it for you and it, that they're doing a good job, and you have that uh, comfort uh, working, so um, uh, so we actually did a, a, a book in 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 Bangla. We translated it. It was illustrated by a French uh, illustrator. Uh, the uh, writer was a French Indian writer, Kartika Nair, it, and it was a book, book on the Sundarbans, the mangrove forest. Um, and uh, you know, f I'm just sharing this because I, you know, this is my, my most recent experience of, of working with uh, a content like this. So we struggled quite a bit with the language because uh, it was originally written in French, and then it was also available in English. Um, the Indian edition was in English, and then you know, translating it to into Bangla and you know making it appropriate for for the Bangla readership. So um, so how how does that? But the illustration, of course, stayed the same across the book. So that was more universal. Um, so that that I, I think that's another reason why I'm asking that you know is uh, you know if if there is if the illustrator can can transcend uh, the story into that uh, to that level, then you know uh, uh, is that is that something that 
uh, you know, you would aspire as an, as an author that, uh, you know, one I suppose one in some ways that's ideal. In some ways, I mean, for, for a kind of young illustrated, say a picture book, but for, for young children, I think the ideal is you end up with a book where you can't tell what came first, the pictures or the words, right. and you can't really imagine one separate from the other. And that's, that's sort of obvious, the books that, you know, if you have a picture book you love, that will probably be the case. This becomes an issue when it moves into another culture, not least because those things that are really integral to the detail of how the words and the pictures work together depend on the words, and the words change when you translate. This is the problem with translating, is you have to change the words. Um, otherwise, translating would be really easy. This is a, this is a slight... Up, when I, I always say that when I'm translating, my aim is to write exactly the same book, but except, you know, the words. So apart from the words, it's exactly the same. And when you have a, a book in which the words and the pictures are in a kind of interesting conversation with each other, changing the words isn't simply a matter of, you know, taking the Portuguese words, translating them to English, and then dumping them back in there, because you want it to be in a kind of proper conversation with the pictures. Right. So I've had a number of occasions where I've translated books for quite young children, and the difficulty hasn't been the language, because the language is normally uncomplicated. The difficulty is how to keep the relationship when the language is coming, now coming from a different culture and the pictures are supposed to be exactly the same. I did a book uh, this year, which is coming out in a few months, where I had to write to the artist and say, you're going to have to change two of the pictures because I can't make the text work because they're very complicated plays on words in this book and I can construct new plays on words, but they only work if you don't look at the pictures, which is slightly problematic in a picture book. Um, so every once in a while you have these situations where there's something really intricate happening between the words and the pictures that are very culturally specific or very uh, regionally specific. Um, and in a way, the, the more well-bound well together those things are, the harder it is to extract it from one place and present it to readers who have a different background and a different language and a different culture. So, uh, so could there be a journey from from the book to an interactive format? And and uh, of course, there is a, there's a lot of examples nowadays um, that are happening. So, I mean, you know, uh, at the Frankfurt Book Fair this time, I saw that you know there were separate companies, you know, working with children's <coughs> literature, transforming them into multimedia books. So, how do you react to that? I think it's a false hope, false goal. I think that you know, technology moves so quickly, so that as soon as you get that app out or that whatever it is, technology would have moved on again. It'll seem really old-fashioned in a way a book might well not. Um, and I, I just I any day now we're going to have a CD-ROM of one of your books. It'll be really exciting. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Have a CD-ROM. They were so exciting for about 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I think that the, the book is the most perfect technology ever devised, and I think there's this desperate need to be new and, and modish, and we're, we're, we're chasing a, a ghost here. So but that's only my, you know, I'm glad a, you said that. Yeah. I, I'm, in this one respect, a conservative. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I think you know, I we could we could go on and on with this, but um, did you want to talk to the audience or you know hear from the audience, uh, you know, uh, if Hello. if there are questions? <laughs> yes. Are there questions? questions? Yes. Sorry, it's, it's really dark there, so uh, you'll Sorry, can I just say, um, I, I've got some of my books I brought from England. I don't really want to take them all back. Um, uh, I think if we can decide, if there's one really brilliant question that comes out today, a new, <laughs> original, challenging, great question, perhaps you could decide. I'll, I'll give a, as a prize one of my books, whether you want it or not. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll reserve my question for the last. <laughs> Well, I'm rising to the challenge then. Uh, my question is basically, uh, when writing children's literature, and I've heard this the last year I came, so some mostly when like the stories of old times or like you know uh, past in the past, so they have a specific lesson in mind when writing. They're they have this target to teach the reader, young reader, that oh, uh, they have a lesson to teach, usually, like, how do you say uh, uh, that? Yeah. A moral that, yeah. uh, There's yeah. a moral, right, the word is the moral, that they have a moral mind they want to teach the children, that nowadays we don't see it, like, directly, I guess, it's mm -hmm. subtle, it's, more, it's getting more subtler than when 
trying to teach the children anymore. So, uh, my question to you is, when you write for children, do you have like a moral in mind when you are portraying the story or the character? And I also would like to point out that like when I was here last year, and there was a children's writer from Africa, and she told us the that if she wanted to get her books published as a children's book, she has to write it in such a way that it has a moral, and so that it, the board, which usually publishes these books, can actually, oh yeah, it has a lesson it wants to teach to children, so yes, I will publish it as such. She, can, she cannot write it like, you know, without any morals. She, she has to have this in mind. And that is the question I asked the uh, Daniel that is this a reality that is usually portrayed in publishing houses? Two questions, basically. I'm sorry if, um, if I... I'll answer that answer. quickly and then I'll, I'll let Tony answer because Tony is, is um, a deeply moral writer. Um, <laughs> as I'm sure you've been able to tell just from being in a room with him. Everything he says is infused with a great need to moralize and improve it's a tough it's a tough calling I have to say um, it's certainly true that it used to be very common um, at least in the UK and in a lot of Europe there was an expectation that books for children were supposed to be uh, they were supposed to be good for you whether they are fun or not is slightly irrelevant but so long as they're good for you um, and they want to make you behave better and they want to make you more devout if you're religious they want to make you um, you know, respect your parents or do well at school or whatever it is. Um, I think we think of that time as having gone now and people, writers not feeling they have to make moral statements. But I also think that something you said in the question was very, was, um, very perceptive that actually what's happened is it's much more subtle now. I think there are relatively few writers who would admit to, you know, this, I, I've written this book so that people don't skip school and do their homework. I don't think writers talk about their work very much in those terms. But I do think that every writer has some kind of moral universe. They occupy a set of morals that are important to them. And even if the, the moral lesson isn't an obvious one, it isn't a kind of you know bludgeoning over the head, very, very uh, you know, aggressive one, which I think children can spot you know, 100 miles off. The, the, I think it's very hard for a writer not to reveal in some ways the things, the, the, the kind of moral values that they have. What this means is a lot of the writers I love the most are the writers who, especially for older children and young adults, are the ones who present their books. When they talk about what they're, they're doing in their books, they don't say, I'm trying to answer a question. They say, I'm trying to ask a question. The reason I've written this book is because there is this question which I think is important and I want readers to, to, uh, to ask this question for themselves. But I think the very fact that you're choosing this question rather than that question, there is something which is implied in that. Can I re reframe the question uh, in philosophical language? It's, um, can morality be an aesthetic quality? So, you know, can didactic, the moral didactic be part of the, what makes a novel or work of art good? And the, um, you know, many modern writers will be resistant to that idea, but there's one towering example which proves that it can be, and that's uh, Dostoevsky. His books are astonishingly wonderful works of art, which do have a very strong moral message. Um, the, you know, the crime and punishment is, has got an incredibly moral Christian message that, 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 that comes out at the end. And you know, in my own work, I have tried to emulate Dostoevsky, um, particularly in the, the Bear Bum Gang and the Football Face-Off, <laughs> which is my, my Dostoevskyan text, um, in, in which uh, a group of, of horrible nine-year-old boys who despise girls um, they, they, they form a, a gang, and there's a, a girl, one of their sisters wants to join the gang, and they, um, they, they are, they humiliate her uh, and, and, and refuse to allow her into their sacred circle. And eventually, by a complicated Dostoevskyan um, piece of plotting, she becomes part of their gang, and they learn to appreciate her for her, her, herself. So, uh, <laughs> but the, the point was, could, could I take that idea of the, the boys learning to appreciate girls? Um, could I, can I make that a, a human drama? worthy of a work of art. Uh, so that's what I attempted to do. If you just have a, a story which you then impose some sort of moral lessons in, it's never going to be a successful work of art. But can it be integrated at that, that level of, 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 of human drama, of human interaction, then it, it, can, it, can, it can work. There are also, I think, ways of, of 
either making things more or less subtle or at least more or less um, suitable to the culture or the time in which a book is written. So there was an old, old children's book, mid 19th century, called uh, What Katie Did. And in What Katie Did, uh, a girl has an accident and she is paralyzed and it's all terrible, but she behaves really well and she prays a lot and as a result is unparalyzed at the end. And there's a very, it's a good story and it's well written, it's a really interesting book, but there's a very, very obvious uh, moral lesson about how you're expected to behave in the world. That book was rewritten, the story was retold, if you like, two years ago by Jacqueline Wilson, the writer I mentioned earlier. In the end of Jack and Wilson's book, the girl isn't miraculously cured, because that would be silly in a book for a British child nowadays. But the story is more or less the same, and what happens at the end is, because the girl is positive and good to her friends and all of these things, she learns to come to terms with it and she has a happy life. It is sort of a, a, a moral ending. Um, it's also an ending which, which has a lesson about how you behave and how people treat you and how you treat other people. It doesn't feel in the same way like it's a, a, a kind of very, very strong, very unsubtle didactic thing. Um, it feels like a dramatically different ending to the original book, though it's not really. It's just contained slightly differently. So, I'm Leonora, and I'm a writer from Copenhagen, Denmark. Hello. And um, I've noticed that in Denmark, people are under the impression that it's extremely easy to write a children's book. And uh, It's really all, easy. Yeah, no, but it? it's, really, it's actually quite strange. All the TV personalities and everyone else are writing children's books. And I'm wondering, is that the same in the UK? Is it like people are, are looking at you and thinking, this is so easy, I can do it too. You know, I have this great idea, I'll write it in two weeks. Is it like that? Yeah, you, you are first. Uh, well, yes, yeah. for, for several years that's been a phenomenon. Of, of some, and, and occasionally they write their own books. Um, on the whole, they don't. They're ghost-written. Um, I think it all began... The, remember, is Katie Price a big figure in a, 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 something she's called, known as Jordan? She was kind of glamour model who started to write children's books, kind of pony books. Uh, but of course she didn't really write them. They were written by somebody else. And because she has so much free time not having to write her own books, I got her to write my books for me. It was, uh, it was great. Uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that, you know, I'd say real writers really despise that. Because these books get loads of publicity and they sell lots and they're not always the greatest works of literature. Except what is quite interesting is some of them are perfectly good because they're not written by them. I mean, this is the thing. There, there, are, some, there are some exceptions. There are people who are famous for something else and write books for children and they turn out to be quite good writers for children, but there aren't many of those. What there are quite a lot of is people who are famous for something completely because they're in a boy band and they decide to write books for children. And then the books turn out to be good because Obviously, they didn't write it themselves, and they hired, you know, a proper writer. Um, I have many writer friends, as I'm sure you do, who have, you know, written books by by Olympic cyclists or whatever it is. For example, I'm thinking of one example. Um, but I think yes, it's absolutely. It, it comes from this this assumption in culture that it can't be a very difficult thing to do, and it also comes from not only an, a misunderstanding of how difficult it is, but also a misunderstanding of what it. Um, of kind of what exists in the world of children's books. So there's a, so Simon Cowell, TV personality, pop impresario person, generally unpleasant, very famous, recently said in an interview a few months ago, uh, I've decided to write some children's books because I have children now and I've read some children's books that exist already and they're mostly quite bad. And so I thought I would write some children's books and I thought um, they'll, be, they'll be about animals. <laughs> Which is a new idea, but no one's ever written a, book, a children's book about animals. It's not a new idea. Yeah. Wait, animals, of course! <laughs> why, why in the last 3,000 years since Aesop has no one thought of doing that? Um, but yes, it's, it's a kind of failure to understand in a way that I, I presume, I mean, I wrote this in a column the other day, the idea that, you know, a, 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 someone in a boy band or, or the brand manager of someone in a boy band would say to them, you know, you have a new album coming out next year, maybe you should think about designing a suspension bridge to go with it. 
because everyone has a suspension bridge design in them and how hard can it be? And then they do an interview saying, you know, I've seen loads of suspension bridges and mostly they're really rubbish. And so I thought I would... And the result is either they get a professional suspension bridge designer to do it or they design, they, they design one themselves. And it's easy to do, except they fall over. I mean, this is the other thing about children's books. Children's books are, in fact, really easy to write, so long as you don't care at all whether they're good or not. Um, you know, it's much easier to write a bad 10,000-word book than a bad 100,000-word book, but, you know, the bad ones are still bad. Well, yeah, slightly controversially, I, I think it is a bit easier to write a children's book than an adult book. It's not easy, but it's a bit easier, I think, having, having done both, in my experience. They're, just, they're shorter. You know, it's a bit, it comes almost that down to that. The, the picture book I just translated. It, it also, I think it probably the shorter it gets, the easier. And then when it gets really short, it starts getting really hard. Because you, if you have to do something which only has 120 words in it, each of those words is really, really difficult to get right. You know, I mentioned those quilted books with a carrot on each page. I think they're probably quite easy to <laughs> well, find out. Maybe I'll fail that yeah. challenge. <laughs> Uh, I have a question to either of you. Uh, this is, it's more like an advice I'm asking as an aspiring, aspiring writer, is especially when, you, when we think of writing fantasy for uh, pre-adolescent kids, not just for young adult fiction, I mean, how much darkness can we actu actually include? I mean, it is kind of established that we're not supposed to write too much violence or, I don't know, scatological humor or excrete you know, excretion of bodily fluids and things like that. That's pretty well but all I write about, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you've yeah, made, you've dismissed his entire career now, isn't it? <laughs> you weren't supposed to do any of that. <laughs> Listen to the woman. That is, that is, of course, for a young adult fiction we understand, especially when, like, Hunger Games and Harry Potter books. I mean, there is a lot of darkness with death and all that. But what if when I write for 8 to 12-year-old kids, or maybe even younger, because I used to be a teacher, and I feel that children do accept a lot of that and they have the ability and the maturity to understand it but we as adults we think they don't so where do we actually strike the balance that's so my question I, I think in terms of, of darkness and violence even for that age range you can go quite dark um you know we're mentioning um Roald Dahl his books can be genuinely scary for either, even younger children um, so I think that that's even, even 42 year olds. <laughs> so I, I think you, you can take go to dark places as long as even perhaps from a commercial point of view, you, you, you circle back up into the light at the end. That seems to be the crucial thing. Uh, you know, my, my instinct would be to to go into the dark place and then circle down from from there. Um, but that's probably not not great commercial advice. I think you know, there are certainly areas where you've got to be careful. So that in the UK, we, uh, Daniel talked about the, the gatekeepers. What they most object to is bad language, oddly. Um, because if you suddenly see a swear word in the text, something you can pick on and focus on. So clearly you have to be careful with your, your, your language in that sense. And also, I suppose, the whole area of, of, of sexuality, which would be a, a big sort of no, uh, which is even more ch even challenging for, for teenagers. But I think it, just in terms of how scary can you be, how dark, I think you can, you can push it. Um, uh, uh, but as, as long as you then do circle back up into the, into the light. I think that's a really important part of the answer, because one of the reasons people read books is to have a safe version of experiences that are not safe in the world. So in order not to have to actually fight a dragon yourself, because while it sounds exciting, it probably, if it happened really, it would be quite unpleasant. But what you can do in the story is you can have this thing that is full of peril, this thing that's full of peril and full of fear and full of darkness and full of anxiety or whatever. But absolutely, as Tony says, in a way, the younger you go, the more important it is that we, that, that that it's okay in the end, that it's safe. So the idea is, you know, within, the, within this, especially it's one of the reasons people write and read fantasy, that you can have, if you like, uh, you can have an experience that is kind of more isolated from your world. Um, and you learn things and you process things and it becomes your way of learning to deal with these, with, with fear and with loss and so forth. Um, but yes, it's, it's partly a question of, of where you go from there and whether you leave the reader with something like hope if you read the, leave the reader with something which is happy and which is resolved and which is... It's just, just occurred to me, I was talking to um, some uh, Danish writer contingent uh, earlier on, um, and uh, I was thinking about, um, I didn't read Hans Christian Andersen as a child, so I read him for the first time to my children, my daughter, and I started reading a story in a, in a children's fairy tale book called The Little Match Girl. 
I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with it, and I didn't know what was going to happen. It's about a little girl on the streets of, 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 uh, of Copenhagen, uh, and it's rather, rather cold. <laughs> and I can assume that at some stage it would be all right. But about halfway through, I realized that no, she was freezing to death and that she was going to die. And I started to cry, and I realized I had to make up a, a new ending for my daughter. So in my version, she's fine. Uh, but in the original, this was classic. She dies. And I suppose it's the, the, the redemption that's certainly back into the light there is that he's a religious writer and there's always heaven. Um, but it was still a pretty devastatingly dark story. As are a lot of fairy tales, most of which were not written for children. They're, they're written for other purposes or, or, or told for other purposes. Um, and so felt no need at all to reassure people at the end. Unless, unless you was, to go to was Anderson writing for children explicitly, or was Anderson he? Anderson was much more than because the, the kind of fairy tales that we have in translated into English, so the Grimm's about whom you know much more than I do. Um, but even someone like Anderson, you you get to the ending of all the Andersons that have been made into you know Disney's or equivalents. Um, any child who's met one of those stories through Disney and then gets to the end of The Little Mermaid, for example, um, when they're reading it and it turns out that it's it's really horrible. I mean, it's kind of profoundly horrible, a lot of the stuff. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> right. But can I interject there? Um, so when, when, you, when you felt like you had to change the ending of the story, what were you really afraid of? Were you afraid that you're, I mean? I was afraid of her being obsessed. You know, it was a. Uh -huh. a, a oh. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> what, what I was afraid of... I was of, patting you in a reassuring... <laughs> I, I, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to cope with her despair about it. Um, yeah. So it was, yeah. it was that. But it was, yeah. it was for you rather than for the kids. It was, yeah. She may have yeah. laughed gleefully through it all. <laughs> <laughs> Monstrous girl that she is. Rosie. Yeah. Because, yeah Hi. Um, uh, I wanted to ask this question to both of you. Um, about looking back at children's books we've read before and finding them a lot more grim and a lot more complex than how we had seen them as children. Do you think this is something that writers deliberately do? And if they do that, is that a smart thing to do? Um, I, I, well, first of all, I should say that the opposite probably happens as well, that there are some books that you uh, absolutely adored when you were 10 and uh, it's always a mistake to go back to them because you discover that actually there is nothing there. Um, I've done various work on projects where I've asked writers to recommend the books they loved when they were children, and in a lot of cases they went back and reread those books, and half of the time they say, it's amazing, it's full, I, I can't possibly have understood it when I read it because there's so much stuff there. And the other half they say, I wish you hadn't made me read that again because I had this lovely memory of how great this book was when I read it 30 years ago. I mean, I think, again, coming back to something Tony said earlier, I think every reader finds different things in books, and every reader brings different things to books, which means that um, certainly if I read Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials now, it's different to if I had read it 20 years ago when it came out, 25, 30 years ago when I was a teenager. On the other hand, my experience then would have been different to the next kids and different to anyone else. Um, not just because people have minds that are more or less sophisticated as readers, but also because people notice different things and care about different things. And one of the things that is exciting about a book like that, or a series like that, or any great book, I suppose, is at different points in, of, of your life, it'll speak to you slightly slightly differently. I'm not sure that means, as a writer, you, you hide things in there for the 45-year-olds to rediscover. But I think people will notice different things. Your, each of your 11, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old readers will will you know, consume this thing in a different way. But also, we, we live in a post-Freudian world, uh, you know, both as individuals having encountered Freud, and Freud now exists, and so it's hard then not to read back perhaps those other elements in, in, into those, what, what we thought were innocent stories. The obvious example is one that is Rapunzel, another Disney-fied one, where, you know the story of Rapunzel, where it's a girl's kept in a tower by a witch, she grows her hair long, she lets her hair down for the witch to climb up. Eventually, a, a handsome prince rides along, and he, he climbs up the hair, uh, and, and the witch at some stage, in, the, in the, most of the English versions, she finds out that the Rapunzel has been seeing the prince. Uh, that Rapunzel just makes some sort of ludicrous slip. She, she says, oh, you're, you're much heavier than, than the prince. Um, but in the original Grimm version, um, which they act themselves borderize later, um, can you guess why, why the witch works out that Rapunzel has been seeing a man? 
she's pregnant. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so you, you know, reading that, that version of the story is a very different version of the story. Wonderful. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, if if there aren't any more questions, do you have an? Is there one? Oh, sorry, you're you're hiding in the in the light. <laughs> yes, I think that will, that that would be the last question. Uh, we're coming to the end. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I would like to know from both of you uh, if you were to select five books that you'd like. Uh, a children under 15 to have read and finished. Uh, what would the five books be? To, to and read for and finished the book and, and enjoyed, offered, presumably. Yeah, and for that book that you offered, for a good question, my question would be, <laughs> <laughs> what would be the one book that you would read if it were the last book that you could read? <laughs> Coward. Mike Fred. If, you, if you're going to advertise me, you Sorry. use the microphone. <laughs> no. <laughs> All those people at the back didn't hear him say nice things about my book. It's very disappointing. Uh, <laughs> Professor Hahn has written The Oxford Companion to Children's Literature, which is essentially a reading list of that kind with, with thousands of recommendations. But what, what would your five be, Dan? Um, my, my instinct is to recommend things that are not enormously famous already, because actually really what I want is people to read Roald Dahl forever, but Roald Dahl isn't actually the only children's writer. Um, so f five great contemporary, more or less contemporary children's writers. Um, I think you should read something of Tony's and I think it should be a book called Brock. Um, uh, unavailable in the bookstall, I'm afraid. Unavailable in the bookstall, but I'm sure can be, can be got, but that, that of Tony's. There's a, a new writer called Catherine Rundle, who's a brilliant, uh, very young English writer, uh, whose most recent book is called The Wolf Wilder which is absolutely fantastic. There is a woman called Hilary McKay who's been writing children's books for years and years and years and isn't nearly appreciated enough, partly, I think, because her best and most successful book had a very pink cover on it, coming back to this question of someone deciding who this book was for. So a book, a series called The Casson Family Series by uh, Hilary McKay. Uh, there's a writer called Patrick Ness, whom Tony and I both know, who wrote a book called A Monster Calls, which um, was illustrated by Jim Kay and which has just been made into a, a movie which uh, is coming out in the, in the, the next few weeks. Um, I don't think I've ever cried so much in a movie and uh, as indeed did all 1,500 people in the cinema, it was the most peculiar experience. But that, that book, Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, that's four and, um, and, and a fifth one and really, a really good fifth book also. We've run out of time, so I can't say my five. <laughs> yeah, go on. Are you trying to use that as an excuse? <laughs> the, the Witches by Roald Dahl would be my, if I had to choose one, yeah. I think that's his masterpiece. Think, yeah. And again, an incredibly complex, dark book, but also very funny. Thank you so much. We have run out of time, and we, we wish could, we could have extended this, but uh, I'm sure they will be available if you wanted to talk to them uh, after the session. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience, and big hand for, for the... You for couldn't the quickly audience. choose a winning question, could you? So I can dump one of my books on a, on a poor victim. Do I have victim. to be the judge? Yes. <laughs> oh my god, I'll be the most... You know, I'm, I'm staying, you guys are leaving, so <laughs> you pick your uh, winner. <laughs> you know, I wasn't really listening to the questions, I drifted off, so what were they? <laughs> Well, somebody, uh, you know, requested it, so uh, I mean, had, a, had a specific question for the book, yep. so yep. maybe. And you've been asking <laughs> questions the whole time with your one good arm as well, so you've broken your arm, so you must be exhausted in that left arm, so I think you, you probably have earned that book yeah. then. <laughs> we'll wrap up with that. Thank you. Okay.